knows there's a place for us where we could go where we could be alone between city lights we don't have to hide i want to go do you want to follow there's something in the air i can't explain it but it's there ain't nobody gonna find us in our secret love affair i don't wanna have to hide no more it shouldn't be a fair up everybody nope oh, i gotta turn that volume down you don't need to hear that twice oh, alex alex get yourself together how are we doing everybody alex is about to switch the cam he's about to switch the cam boom hello everybody i'm joshua bardwell you're gonna learn something today welcome back to the stream dave lockwood i also get pumped when i hear that song have an intro music i feel so official i feel so legit no echo? Okay, good. I am back at home. It's good to be back in my normal location with my normal streaming setup and my normal high quality, high production values. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Ken Heron, are you here in the live stream? Did I see somebody ch shouting out Ken Heron? I went on... Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's good. I went on Ken Heron's live stream, his... Uh, Thursday Night Live uh, was Thursday night, as you might have guessed. I uh, had a fun interview with him. You want to talk production values? That guy, that guy has a, uh, a setup. He's got a soundboard. I felt like being on a radio morning show. I'm still not sure if that was a good thing or not, but no, not, not going on his show. Just the, the, I'm not sure I want to have a soundboard. Maybe that's, I'm not sure if that's my style, but it really works for him. It was really fun. He has a, such a professional prepared stream like with research and and a, an outline wow what somebody can't see Steve Alvarez oh no it wasn't I, I changed it I changed it you're good you're good you guys can see anyway yeah Ken is I was gonna say was because but he actually still is a radio host like a professional so of course his show feels like it was kind of cool though it gave me it's always inspiring to see people who do things better than you uh, to think about ways you could be doing it different um anyway but here we are 
And it's the Q&A live stream Sunday at 1. In case you're new here, if this is your first live stream, say hello. Hello, chat. Uh, I'll keep an eye. I'll give you a little shout out. Uh, you ask questions, I answer questions. That's pretty much how it goes. Uh, we have some fun. Uh, let me give you a look at what I got going on here. This is my screen, my main screen that I'm looking at. And I got y'all's chats right here. Michael Alexa, Ken Heron is the Howard Stern of the quad world. I'm not going to go into the com the detailed comparisons of things that Howard Stern does that Ken Heron doesn't because this is a family-friendly stream. I see what you're going for, though. <laughs> um, so I got you, your questions here, like this one. DJI FPV powered off a 12-volt Beck with 6S. Is that okay? Yes, Nathaniel, that is okay. It pulls about 9 or 10 watts. So the Beck needs to be able to handle about 9 or 10 watts. So do the math, 12 volts at how many amps is 9 or 10 watts. But other than that... Yeah, you're fine. As long as it's the DJI unit isn't. See, there you go. That's exactly how it goes. You ask the questions, I answer the questions. Um, if you want to make sure that your question gets noticed, because I watch the I watch the replay sometimes, guys, of the live stream, and I'm like, oh, people were asking a question, and I was just talking and talking and talking, and I missed the questions. But if you want to make sure that I get your question, hit that dollar sign right down there. Throw a, a, a super chat at me. Wow, Prop Pirate, Pirate with a $20 super chat starting it off strong. Thank you, Prop Pirate. That's a that's a big super chat. Thanks for the Tiny Hawk help on Friday. You saved the day. Wow, thank you, Prop Pirate. Thanks for your donation. So if you want to make sure I get your question, hit that dollar sign. Pull it out right here into the super chats. Uh, but I'm going to take a lot of questions from the regular chat as well, as always. And, and over here in the Discord, hello, Discord, Simon Saucy. What's up, dude? How old are your kids? Uh, I have a four-month-old and an eight-year-old. DJ Pop, hello, cookies. You are in the famous internet live chat right now, cookies. This Discord server, people ask, how do I get on the Discord server? Because they like to be, I don't people like to be on the Discord server. Reminds me of the Seinfeld routine where he says, you know, people like to go out. Why are they, where are we going? Out, I don't know. They want to, people want to get in the Discord server. Why? I don't know. We want to be in. So if you want to be in the Discord server, one of, uh, you got to join my Patreon. That's the way you get into the Discord server. There's a link in the video description if you want to join the Patreon. Two bucks a month, then you get in the Discord server. And, uh, you know, then you get to just say you're in my Discord server, I guess. I don't know. Mm. <clears throat> so, let's do. Let's do some. Let's do some. No, no. Let's start. Let's, before we start with questions, though, I like to do a little bit of news of the day. Not, not as good as Ken Heron. Did you guys think I should do a collab with Ken Heron? We talked about doing a collab. Let me know in the chat what you think about that. Would you like to see me do a collab with him of some kind? <coughs> Pardon me. You know, like he flies a race drone, I fly a phantom. I don't know. News of the day. Um, Orca. Orca FPV1 has been delayed. They posted over on their Facebook group. There's been a two or three week delay on the very first ones. And when people saw this, they were like, aha, here it is. No, no. Uh, I don't know if it's quite that dire. It's really funny, though, the thing that caused them to be delayed. What was the thing? What, the problem was that they had they had sourcing commitments for a particular part of the goggle. And then their their supplier had a delay and they couldn't produce the goggles on time because of this delay. Thank you, Karen Heron, for that $10, $10 super chat. Um have him chase your quad with his phantom. Nice. But here's the funny thing. So so Orca is like, don't freak out, guys. We just had a slight delay on sourcing this part. Everything's going to be fine. Um, and they, what they have said is that the people who were supposed to get the goggles in August won't get them for a couple weeks. But then the rest of their delivery timeline, they say they're going to keep to it. But the funny part is the exact part <laughs> that caused the delay was <laughs> the power button. <laughs> oh, my God. So there's Fat Shark over in the other corner going like, oh, yeah, it's so easy to add a power button, huh? Suck it. <laughs> it was the power button. I can't believe it. Anyway. Um, yeah, so Orca, tiny delay, hopefully still on track. Orca has, uh, promised, uh, that I did, I said, I was talking to the, the, my, the guy from Orca and I said, look, I don't want to be presumptuous. Uh, I didn't mean to, when, there, cause some people were like, Joshua, you didn't buy into the Orca Kickstarter. Does that mean you don't believe in them? No, that's not what it means. 
And I actually reached out to them and said, hey, guys, I hope I didn't, I didn't mean to send like the wrong message. I just I just kind of assumed and I hope this wasn't presumptuous, but I just kind of assumed you were going to send me a review unit because, you know, we've we've worked together. We did, we've, I did a little anyway. And they were like, yeah, no, of course, we're going to send you one. We would. Of course we would. Who would release a major FPV system and not send it to the Joshua Bardwell? Well, who could who would who would do that? <laughs> okay mm. no video or sound julio morales if you have no video or sound reload the page dude i as far as i know i'm i'm still streaming my stream is good so josh lizzie i can't help you dude i can't help you about that josh lizzie is having a problem with a drone mesh giveaway i don't know why you think i will be able to help you with that i don't really like he doesn't work for me dude Hmm. Tumbleweed30 asks, did DJI ever end up sending you a unit? DJI has expressed that they intend to send me a unit, but I have not actually received one yet. It's no big deal. I'm flying mine. In fact, I went down to Orlando uh, this week to shoot some Rotor Riot episodes. Looking forward to seeing some of those come out. Uh, had some fun shooting those. And I flew I, at every spot that I flew. I made sure to fly my DJI freestyle quad so I was getting like a good sense of how it compared. And I will say this. Um, we, we showed up at a spot. Me, Drew, Corey, uh, Little Stellar Fox, Zoe FPV was there, uh, or Jeff Orta, Vortex, a whole bunch of people were there. And I pulled out my DJI quad and I started flying it. And I was having a great time. The performance of the DJI system is quite good. Um, what I like to say is it's not perfect, but it's it's very good. But there was, a, like, it felt like, you know how, like, in the lunchroom, everybody's at the table, and then there's that one kid who's over off in the corner, and he's not sitting at the table with the rest of the cool kids? And it kind of felt that way because they, I had my DJI goggles on, and they were like, oh, hey, look at this gap I just hit. Oh, you know, and they're all having a social experience that I'm not a part of. Not because of my personality, but because of the fact that the DJI goggles don't have analog support, uh, so they can't look at me unless they had their DJI goggles with them. Which, uh, and it really, I, I found myself going, okay, I got the DJI shot, great, I got that footage. And then I was happy to put back on my analog goggles and be able to share in this social communal experience with everybody else. That is an aspect of the DJI system that you really have to take into account, I think. Okay. Anyway, so Orca, News of the Day, DJI, Yada. Okay, let's do some questions. <laughs> mm. Let's see here. What do we got? Looking at the patrons here. What do you think about the Fat Shark Scout? Ryan Stein asks. What do you think about the Fat Shark Scout? I'm very happy that I'm back home and now I can just pop on over to... Boom, my other screen like I normally can sit on my, my laptop. This is the Fat Shark Scout. Um, I'm a big fan of these Fat Shark goggles. Uh, the reason you don't hear me talk about them more is largely because I usually, I prefer Fat Shark style goggles, not box style goggles. When people ask me about box style goggles, I do bring up the FXT Viper, the Eoshin EV800D, and sometimes the fat shark scout or fat shark recon um but the reason you don't hear me talk about it more probably is that i just mostly don't talk a lot about box style goggles in general let's see here have i tried the diatone cube yet i have not cookies i would be interested to try it uh i do think diatone generally makes a pretty good ready to fly uh, there are so many i here's the thing here's the thing that i get into um it's so hard because product reviews are actually not my favorite content to make. Technical stuff and how-tos are my favorite type of content to make. But I feel like it's like, you know, the broccoli versus dessert. You guys, I mean, everyone loves product reviews. Everyone is so interested in products. Look at the success of UAV Futures, which he has in every way earned. This is not a dog on him. But... He is very product focused. He does a ton. I don't know how he does so many products. How does he have time to review all these new products that are coming out? Look at Oscar Leong, who has 
content about every new product that comes out. And it's easy for me to get in like, oh, there's a new hot product. I have to review it. Like, for example, Beta FPV HX Toothpick Drone. Yeah, I'm going to be reviewing that. Happy Model Larva X. Yeah, I got that on the list. So now there's the new Diatone Cube. I could spend literally every day of the week testing a new product and then never make any educational content. And the, I, the irony is, the really sick part is, I would make a lot more money if I did that because affiliate income would be a lot higher. But I like to make educational content and I feel like my reviews are more trustworthy if you guys don't feel like I'm just chasing every new product and reviewing it. So I try to focus on like really hot stuff, really exciting stuff. And I try to just not get overwhelmed with that. But like the Diatone Cube, so good. Uh, so is everything else. What am I going to do? I don't know. Anyway. Have I tested the Ethics S5? Wow, Danny FPV. I've flown the S3 and the S4. I haven't tested the S5. I don't know about that. Hmm. Roland B says, my Tiny Hawk took a dunk in the water. I dried it out. It flies well. What should I do? Keep flying it. You lucked out, man. When am I planning on building the Acrobrat, asks Goodwin. So I'm doing a collab with Aaron Ciotti. Aaron Ciotti was on my live stream uh, last week. Um, hang on a second. I actually need to check something. Because Ciotti said he was going to start live streaming more often. Let me just check with him so I can I can tell you guys when his next stream is going to be. Okay. Um, he is so, so knowledgeable about micros, and I am just unabashedly trying to soak up his knowledge and educate myself. Everybody, everybody says, you know, how do you, how do you know so much about, and I just hang out with people who are smarter than me, and then I just extract all the knowledge from them through osmosis. So, um, but, um, we are working, he's helping me spec out an Acrobrat three inch build, uh, Right now, I have all the parts for that except the motors. We're waiting on some prototype 1506 motors to come out from iFlight. iFlight is helping with some of the gear for the build. Uh, that is currently the only part that I don't have. And he it just insists that 1506 is the right size motor for that build. And I'm like, could we use a 1408? He's like, no, 1506 is the best. So that's what we're waiting for. That will be coming uh, in maybe a, probably the next month, I would say. Let's see here. Steel said the S5 is not coming out yet. Yeah, so uh, speaking of which, speaking of Mr. Steel and Impulse RC and so forth, what the F, what do you guys think of this? Have you guys seen this? The Impulse RC Apex. This is the new uh, frame, I guess, Impulse RC, kind of like a combination of the Alien and the Reverb. Um, I guess finally Mr. Steel is going to, is he going to be switching off the alien to this? I don't know. Pretty exciting. Pretty exciting new frame. Not a cheap frame. That's for damn sure. It does come with a two year warranty. So that's, ex that's, that's good. You know, if you're going to spend a shitload of money on a frame, you may as well get a warranty. Um, very, very interesting. Haven't tested it. Haven't reviewed it. There's a ready to fly version that is like, I mean, you could do a lot worse. And it's also very interesting to me to be seeing so many frame makers now starting to make HD capable versions of the frame for the DJI unit specifically for it. Um, I've seen, you guys uh, may not know about this, but there are flight controllers coming out from, I know for a fact, Hobbywing, T-Motor, and Holybro, and probably more that are specifically designed for use with the DJI Air unit. They have a plug and just basically one wire goes boop, boop to the DJI Air unit powers it off of a regulator so you can use 6s has the uart connections has the s bus connection um, i mean dji is making a big splash here dji is the gear being tailored toward dji is definitely coming mbfpv in the discord says the apex looks almost exactly like the johnny fpv frame i do see some similarities there i know there are probably differences you know like like the you know, thickness of the base plate. They, I mean, how many different ways are there to design a frame at the end of the day, right? There's only so many different things you can do, so. So, let's see here. 
Jewelder in the Discord asks, should you solder the ESC cables to the flight controller if you can? I use a plug, but I'm a little bit worried about them coming loose. Now, Jewelder, I trust the 4-in-1 plug. Um, the soldering will obviously be a little more reliable than a plug, but I trust the plug. I've never had one come loose. If you really care, you can put a tiny bit of hot glue on the plug. Let's see here. Can you comment? A boiler asks in the regular chat, can you please make a comment on the SkyZone SkyO3 OLED goggles? A boiler, uh, SkyZone is sending me a set of those to review. I did, they sent Drew a set, because you remember Drew used to fly SkyZone in his primary goggle, and um, he switched to HDOs, and uh, so SkyZone is like, Drew, please come back, <laughs> and send him a set. I looked at them, uh, and I am pretty impressed. I'm going to wait till I get my own, and I actually get to fly them before I give them, like, a full endorsement, but I do feel like, like Sky Zones, it has so it has four three resolution screens, which I prefer. Uh, one of the things I didn't like about Sky Zones in the past was that they usually had the widescreen aspect ratio, which isn't just isn't the kind of camera I prefer to use. And then there was some argument over whether the image quality of the Sky Zone was better than like the HDO or the Attitude. But now with the OLED screen and the Sky Zone Sky O three O. Like, I really feel like SkyZone has gone, all right, fine. Let's just go right out. Let's just go punch the biggest guy in the room in the chin. Um, I do like that the SkyZone has the ability to adjust things like the brightness, which Fat Shark doesn't have. So, like, if if your saturation is too high, some people feel that OLED screens have too much saturation in, and they don't like that rich color. The SkyZone lets you adjust that. Fat Shark doesn't. That's, that's, that's a big deal. Um... The biggest thing about SkyZone that so I was talking, I'm gonna just quote Drew here. I said, Drew, so you're gonna go back to Sky Zones? And he's like, Well, I love Rapid Fire so much. Rapid Fire is so freaking good that once you've gotten used to the way Rapid Fire works, it's kind of hard to go back. Um, and that's not like the hype train. That's just that's just what like all the pro pilots say, and it's. I mean, it's. I think it's demonstrably true. So, if Skyzone had the ability to like have a rapid fire ground station, I don't know. Maybe at that point, though, like, where are you financially? I don't know. But I think if you're looking at like, how much is the Sky O three O? How much is it? Let me just check that real quick. Sky O three O Race Day Quads has it for sale for four twenty nine. That is almost exactly the price of a Fat Shark HDO. So HDO has come down, I believe, to 450, but you're with HDO, you're then going to buy the rapid fire on top of that. Probably because let's face it, if you're buying HDOs, you're probably going to buy a rapid fire, but you're going to spend another 50 to 150 dollars on a module. So your HDO purchase is coming in between 500 and 650 dollars. 429 for the Sky O3O is pretty compelling. It's pretty compelling. Cameron Scarlett says Bite Frost is going to smoke DJI. Cameron Scarlett, let's talk about that. Fat Shark Bite Frost is Fat Shark's HD competitor to DJI. And when DJI dropped, like one day later, Fat Shark was like, hey, you guys, we've got our own thing in the works. Ha <laughs> And everybody was like, aha, DJI, F you. And then they were supposed to send review units in two weeks and they didn't. And then they made an announcement. Hey, did you miss this? Fat Shark made an announcement that they were to post. They had tested the the Bite Frost against the DJI, and they said although we think that Bite Frost is definitely better than analog, Bite Frost is not as good as the DJI, and we're gonna hold it back for a little while until we can you know know that it's better. And they didn't. I don't think they gave a time frame for that. It's sort of like indefinitely. So. It really feels like Fat Shark was pushed to jump the gun. Sorry, I had a little smuts on my glasses. Pat, Fat Shark was pushed to jump the gun on their announcement because they they wanted to get off, get 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 in on that hype. And then when they saw what they were up against, they were like, "Hold on." And to their credit, to their credit, because one thing that manufacturers in FPV get a lot of flack for is releasing inferior, unfinished, untested products to the market, letting the market do all the testing, and then Gen 2 or Gen 3 is the actual version, and everybody who bought Gen 1 wasted their money. Fetrick did not do that. They could have done that. They could have sold Bite Frost for $300, and then nine months from now released like the real deal, and everybody who bought it was out of luck. But 
at the same time, I think it really demonstrates where they are because in, let's say in six or nine months, Fat Shark releases Bite Frost. DJI now has a nine, six or nine month head start. Do you think DJI is just going to go, well, we did it, guys. We're done. They are making it better right now. So if DJI is better than Bite Frost today, DJI, the, the default position is that they will be better six to nine months from now. So Fat Shark has a lot of catching up to do. That's a fact. So I just think people who say, Bite Frost is going to smoke DJI, I, I think that you really got to temper that. I don't think, I think that's a tough one. Mm. Controller man Dan says, all this talk of Fat Sharks and Sky Zones while I'm still rocking my EV800D sad phase. EV800D is a great goggle, dude. Okay, let's go to the Super Chats. We're 20 minutes into the stream. I haven't done a single Super Chat. Let's go ahead and get some of the Super Chats out of the way. Jamie Whitehead, no problem that you're late. You're you're okay, man. There's no you can always rewind if you want to. <laughs> Prop Pirate, I already thanked you for twenty bucks. Thank you. That's a huge, very generous donation. Thank you so much. Ken Heron, thanks for ten bucks. Ken would also like to see a collab. Ken actually lives in Tennessee. He's only about four or five hours away from me. So maybe we'll maybe we'll do something. Yeah, he seems like a cool guy. Solo FPV, thank you for two, uh, three, three pounds. What's the best setup for longer flight times? Uh, Solo FPV. Solo FPV, I have a video, 10 tips to fly longer. This type of video in YouTube parlance, in case you didn't know, is called a listicle. A listicle, it's an article that's a list. 10 tips to fly longer. Listicles are so hot. They get so many clicks. It's crazy. Uh, Soul FPV, I'm going to paste this in the chat for you, and I'm going to tag your name with the link, and you can click that and check that out. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Just watch that video. Tips are right there. Um, I'll, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, I'll summarize for you. Make your quad lighter. Use lower KV motors. Use larger props. These are some of the things you can do. Details in that video. Uh, Rise FPV. Thank you for five bucks. FPV camera cuts off when bumped or I flip. Change the camera. Same things happen. Change to another power source. Rise FPV. Uh, the number one thing that causes the FPV camera to drop out when you do flips or bump. Well, so let's say that it happens when you do flips. What's usually happening there is that the voltage regulator is browning out. The motors surge when you do a sharp snap, flip, or roll, and that causes a voltage drop, and that causes the regulators to brown out. Uh, typically, what I'll do in that case is I will cuss at the manufacturer of the flight controller. Yes, even if it's mine, my some of my flight controllers have had this problem. Sorry. And I'll move the power to VBAT. If you move the power to VBAT, then it should never brown out because the whole quad would fall out of the sky if it browned out. Um, if it does it when it's bumped, though, bumped means a wiring problem because the regulator probably doesn't care if it's getting bumped. And then I would tr I would change the wiring. You said you changed the camera, but I would actually redo the whole wiring harness from the flight controller to the camera. A flip could also be bad wiring because the, when you do the flip, it kind of jiggles the the loose wire or whatever. Stephen Lowenson, thanks for five bucks, no question. Uh, Redbeard the pirate, thanks for pilot. Redbeard the pilot, thanks for two bucks. Technical thoughts on INAV versus Betaflight for scene style. Um, Redbeard, I don't for scene style. I'm not sure there's an advantage INAV versus Betaflight. You're not doing super aggressive flight moves, flippy floppy stuff. In your, when you're doing scene style, like cine whoop style stuff, you're generally doing slow tracking moves, and then you're going to real steady the shit out of it after that. So as long as you have a smooth tune, I don't think like super aggressive like PID controller stuff is really – but on the flip side, for iNav, I don't – I mean what's the advantage of iNav? You've got things like GPS and so forth. You're, not, you're probably not using that either, so hmm. anyway. Um, Roland B, thanks for five bucks. William Kazaka, thanks for a buck. YouTube, and thank you for ten dollars. Big donation there. Twelve inch prop long range carbon frame for T motor MN three one one zero seven hundred kV. Can't find any lightweight frames. 
If anything on the market is X class racing or old. Yep, that is a problem, YouTube. And if you're targeting 12 inch props, there are not a lot of 12 inch props, 12 inch prop frames being made today. Most of them are, when you get up into that size prop range, you're looking at either X class, which is not what you want to do, or you're looking at like DJI style camera platform frames, which is not what you're looking to do. Um, I appreciate the $10 donation, but I'm going to have to throw this one to the chat. Chat, do you know any frame that would fit YouTube in's uh, uh, requirement for 12 inch props, long range carbon frame? Like if you were asking for seven inch props, yeah, seven inch is popular enough that there's a ton of frames that you could use, but I just don't know a 12 inch that can do it. You're asking about a mode two shredder. Let's at least look at that. Let's at least look at the mode two shredder and see what we got here. I mean, you say, would custom arms work on the Mode 2 Shredder? Like, probably. If you can get custom arms cut, you could put... But the problem is that once you get to a certain length of frame, uh, length of arm, just extending the arm isn't going to work because you're going to get a ton of resonance. They're not going to be stiff enough. You might need stiffer arms. Um, what's the Hildebeest? Is that it? Hildebeest frame. Yeah. What about the Hilda Beast? Oh, there you go, dude. Now this is technically uh, YouTube, and this is the direction I'm going to point you. These are technically Beast class frames, but I think they actually fit the bill of what you're looking for, and I think they may be one of the closest things. The Hilda Beast 570. I think this may actually be one of the closest things to what you're looking for. Rotor builds. Where can I actually buy the freaking frame? Okay. I don't know. You're going to have to look this up. But the Hildebeest 570 would be the direction I'd point you, YouTube. And nah, no, they don't actually have the frame for sale. That's the direction I would point you, dude. Cement Kid, thanks for five bucks. Runcam Split says, memory full with a blank card. Um, can you format the card inside the Runcam as opposed to on your PC, Cement Kid? And Corn Sponson. Thank you for 12 or 11 euros. Does the DJI remote work on the Steam game? So the DJI remote does not plug into your computer. It cannot be used as a simulator. But Betaflight has the ability where if you have any Betaflight flight controller, the flight controller can act as the game interface. So you plug your quadcopter, you plug your, your DJI controller, connects to the DJI air unit. The air unit connects to the flight controller. The flight controller plugs into the PC, and then you can use your uh, your DJI controller uh, to control a simulator. Let me find you the video for that. Yeah, here's the video. So let me tag you here and paste it in. Okay. There you go. There's the super chats. We're all caught up. The FC license to drive, you're right about that license to drive. The flight controller does have to be an F4. It is not an F3, uh, but most people today are using F4 or higher, I think. FPV Freaky reminds us that for the run cam split, if you have a 64 gig card, it won't work. Are you sure about that? I know that some SD card devices uh, will not work with bigger than a 32 gig card. I didn't know the split was one of them, but that is worth checking out at FPV Freaky. Parker Boy says, nervous about setting up my crossfire. Last time I fail safe, 35 feet from me, lost it in the pond. GoPro 7 and all. Parker Boy, crossfire should not fail safe 35 feet away. It just shouldn't. Something is wrong with your situation. Frankly, even if you like just rip the whole antenna off the thing at a distance of 35 feet, like I have turned crossfire on and forgot to plug my forgot to screw my antenna onto the module and the RSSI was going all over the place, but I still was in the air thirty five feet away and then I was like, What's going on? and I landed. Um unfortunately it's hard to tell you what you did wrong because now your quad is in a lake. Like, was it just a wiring issue with the with the, with your signal wires? I don't know, man. It just, that, but that definitely shouldn't happen. Mike Alexa says the larger SD card needs to be reformatted to FAT32 with third-party software. It will work. So it's the 
It's the format, huh? Rectorson asks, I have the Brave browser and want to donate my bat to you, but you aren't verified. Do you have plans on accepting Brave donations? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I have looked into this Brave thing specifically probably because you're asking me about it. I think you're the, I don't know. I don't have any specific plan on doing that. It seems like some new cryptocurrency or whatever, and I don't. I just, 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 can you just give me like real money? I mean, I do accept crypto. Uh, if you go to my website, I am set up to accept. Like, I, it's not that I'm like some luddite who hates crypto. I like crypto's cool. I dig crypto. It's just like there's a million different things out there, and I'm not sure I want to like get into all of. See, look here, right? Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, you name it. I probably have. For all I know, for all I know, I have like seven Bitcoins sitting there. I haven't checked those recently to see if I actually have any money on them. <laughs> Von Base, I am not in Atlanta. I'm back in Knoxville. Back in Knoxville. For FPV Freaky says you can format the SD card in the Cadex FPV app. I have done it with a 64 gig card and it does work. Okay, so um, Cement Kid, check out the Cadex FPV app, which can format the card and then try that in your run cam. Let's see here. Simon Saucy wants to know, will Dominator 1s work with Rapid Fire? Do Dominator V1s take a module? Like, do they have the same shape? I guess it looks like they do. Dom V1, yikes. What's the resolution on a Dom V1? I don't even remember. Wow. That is how much? A hundred bucks for Dom V1s. That's tempting. That's tempting. Dom V1s are super old, but for a hundred bucks, they might be worth getting. I don't remember the resolution though. What do I think about the Diatone Cube 339? I think a lot of people are asking me about it, but I haven't flown it yet. Looks pretty cool. Looks pretty cool. Parker Boy wants to know if it might have been the flight controller. I heard I had the Mamba stack, heard it had issues with 5 volts. Parker Boy, that's possible. I mean, the 5 volt regulator dropping out would be a reason for a close range crossfire failsafe. When when I when we're talking about crossfire in general, crossfire doesn't have problems with firmware and doesn't have problems with the radio link in general. Um, if you're at a distance of 10 kilometers, then like your antenna being mounted wrong could come into play. But if you're at typical FPV distances, you should just have like 99% link quality all the time. Um, if your antenna like literally pops off and comes disconnected, then you could have, but at a distance of 35 feet, like it really just shouldn't freaking matter. Um, so if I had a crossfire failsafe at very close range, I would be looking in the direction of like a power issue, the five volt regulator, the, the signal wire was damaged or something like that. I wouldn't be looking at like firmware issue or antenna issues probably. William Kaziaka wants to know what module should I put in my Fat Shark Attitude V5? I mean, like money's no object, the rapid fire, just like no brainer. I hope, I hope you guys don't, I hope you guys understand that I don't want to sound like a fanboy. There's a there's a balance that I have to strike as a reviewer. Like when a new project product comes out and there's all this hype, I res, I am so re look at Fat Shark Bite Frost. Do you see me hyping that? I'm so reserved. But Rapid Fire has been out for so long and it has proved itself so thoroughly that I've it's I've just got to the point where I'm like, okay, no, I mean I'm just gotta you gotta just call it like it is, right? It would be it would be incorrect for me to go. I can't say that. I have to maintain the appearance of objectivity. No, rapid fire is very very freaking good for most people. Rapid fire is going to be the best performing module that you. I mean, somewhere out there, there's a guy who says, "Nah, I I use True D and it's even better." Okay, for you it's better, but in general, I think rapid fire is the best you can get at any price. It's expensive as crap, but it is pretty. I mean. If you were to get something like the Owl RC or the True D, you would get good performance and it would be much, much cheaper. Did 
Does RF stand for radio frequency? That is correct, Sir Caps Luck. Easy one. JMFPV says, cheers from Spain. Cheers, JMFPV. Salut. No, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, Russian or German. Or, I don't know Spanish. My rapid fire came faulty, says Arrowmaker. Then I, I mean, in any production line, some d faulty units will get through QC. That's a fact. If your rapid fire came faulty, then I guarantee you Immersion RC or the vendor you bought it from, one of them will make it right. Do not hesitate. If your rapid fire came from the factory, I've seen Immersion RC do this. I know this for a fact. If they can't, if it's damaged, they will send you a new one, and they will take your other one back, and they will send it to their service center to try to figure out what was wrong with it. Crunked FPV wants to know: Is LaForge V4 still good, even though UBAT is dead? It's like forty bucks on Heli Nation. Well, here's the thing, Crunked FPV: LaForge is a decent performing module. They haven't updated their firmware in over a year, and now they're out of business. If you want to pay forty bucks for a decent performing module that will never be updated ever again. Go for it. Forty bucks for a LaForge is a heck of a good price. Um, I'd take a forty dollar LaForge. Fifty fifty five bucks for a True D. That's tough. I don't know. I personally, I would hesitate to buy a module where the company that makes it is out of business. But we know that the firmware is pretty solid. It doesn't have any major bugs. It's just not going to be improved either. Azel1111 in the Discord asks, sometimes when I test GPS rescue, it climbs and it won't stop climbing. I'm a little bit afraid of what will happen if I have a real failsafe. So Azel1111, uh, the way that the logic works is when GPS, Betaflight GPS rescue activates, the quad will climb to either a preset altitude that you configure or the highest altitude that it saw during your flight. The idea is, let's say that the return altitude is 70 meters, uh, 70 feet, 100 meters, whatever you want to call it. And you flew over an obstacle that was like, you know, 150 meters. All right, so you don't want to fly back at 100 meters and smash into the obstacle. If you got like a weird GPS reading in the middle of the flight and your altitude was read wrong, then it'll try to fly back at that altitude. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. It's the only thing I can think of. Uh, I agree that until you can test it and it works correctly every time, you should not be using it as failsafe. Do not use it as failsafe until you're sure it works. OCD FPV wants to know, is there a way to get Smart Audio 2.1 working with Betaflight? I thought that Betaflight 405 had a Smart Audio fix, didn't it? I thought that it was fixed. Is it not? Trib says in the Discord, even Trappy said that Rapid Fire is better than the TBS Fusion at close distances. Trib, I saw that live stream, and to me, that feels like a little bit of like, like what does that even mean? Rapid Fire is better at close distances, but Fusion may be better at long distances. What does that even mean? It feels like that's like him wanting to acknowledge that Fusion is not necessarily the best but kind of wanting to be a little cagey about it that's what it feels like to me um it, it, here's the thing though given how much tbs consistently says we are the best at everything no one can compare to our amazing products right when has tbs ever said oh no we're not the best we're pretty good though when have they ever said that? So it feels to me like the fact that they're not saying that about the fusion might tell you something. I don't know. Until the actual product comes out, we will never know. Deimos Overkill in the chat asks, how far away from other antennas should I install my GPS module? As far as possible and with a clear view of the sky. I think the best location for the GPS is either on top of the GoPro, which is where some people have put it, or on top of the battery. There are some people who put it on the battery strap. And so it's uh, putting it on the back of the quad right next to the 5 gigahertz antenna is, I mean, it, it's on a different frequency. So it, it still will work, but it can pick up interference. Um, I put mine on the arm 
and it does okay. The further, the better, but there's only so far you can get it on a mini quad. Sir Capsulot wants to know, do you choose run cam camera control on a UART even if you're using a Fox or Predator V4? Sir Capsulot, if I have the option to use UART control on a camera, I do. Analog control sometimes works perfectly, but often does not work. And if I have a free UART, and if the camera supports UART control, I just use the UART. But I don't think anybody except run cam has UART control. Am I wrong about that? You can get a RunCam camera control adapter board, and then that'll work with any camera, I think. Um, I think on Caddx cameras, the down button doesn't work. But the RunCam camera control adapter board will let you use UART control with any camera, but only RunCam cameras have UART control built in, as far as I know. Let's see here. What do I think of Radio Link stuff? Stuff asks Controller Man Dan. Uh, Radio Link. I was nothing wrong with Radio Link, but I like OpenTX. If Radio Link released a radio that ran OpenTX, then I would be thinking about it. I like OpenTX though. And so, since Radio Link doesn't run OpenTX, I kind of don't really give it a second look. <laughs> Hey, Eternal Maver wants to know, I keep losing sats during the flight, GPS sats. What's going on? Um, I don't think that the Betaflight configuration can cause the GPS unit to lose sats. All the Betaflight configuration does is tell Betaflight how to talk to the GPS. I don't think Betaflight actually like configures the GPS at all. So if the GPS unit is losing sats, look at the LED on the GPS unit, right? I mean, Betaflight, I guess, could be misreading the number of sats. But look at the LED on the GPS unit and see if it actually indicates that it's lost lock. Um, I, I would probably try changing the mounting location of the unit or changing to a different unit. Realize that some GPS units only take 3.3 volt input power, whereas some take between 3.3 and 5 volts. And if you run a 3.3 volt unit on 5 volts, it will work, but then it will burn itself out slowly over time. So that could be it. Yaman says, hey, JB, I've connected the smart audio port of the Unify Evo to an unused TX pad of the flight controller. Also enabled smart audio, but it's not working. Yaman, what you have to do, the, the Evo and the Unify Pro 32 come from the factory shipped for Crossfire control. So I believe that you need to go into the TBS Agent X software and configure, plug it, plug it in with USB. There's a button press combination that can do it too, but it's a pain in the ass. So plug it into USB, start the TBS Agent X software, and in there you can configure the Evo to use smart audio instead of Crossfire, and that's, I think, what you need to do. Let's see here. Got some more super chats coming in. Let me get those out of the way. Dogar FPV, thanks for two bucks. No question. Goodwin, thanks for five bucks. Parker Boy, thanks for five bucks. Marley Lepo, thanks for 20 Norwegian kroner. Is it kroner or kroners? Probably kroner. What's up, Marley? Thank you, Marley. True Style, thanks for five bucks. I just broke my 2S Beta 75X Pro 2 flight controller. Was going to repair it, but there's so many options in the small ducted space. You got any favorites? Um... The ducted space, I think beta is still killing it in the ducted space. I mean, you could upgrade to like a newer one, but honestly, most of the stuff that's going on right now in the micro space seems to be focused more on the toothpick style, two inch, two and a half inch ductless. That beta 75X is a damn good quad, even to this day. Let me ask in the chat, what do you guys think? Beta 70, what beats the beta 75X today, or is it still pretty good? JJ Joker Design says both Unify VTX have to run the last beta firmware in order to get smart audio working. Really? It doesn't work at all out of the box? Yikes. Thank you for pointing that out, JJ Joker. I'm going to remember that. 
Ben Jacobs asks, what's the best micro camera? Looking at the Cadex F2 Turbo or the Foxier Micro Aero Pro, do you have any opinions? I want to spend 20, 35 bucks max. Well, Ben Jacobs, um, I think for 20 bucks, the Foxier Micro Aero is a fantastic budget pick. I don't think it has the best picture, but it has a very good picture and it's only 20 bucks. For 35 bucks, I would be looking at the Cadex Rattel. I think it has a very good picture. There are some small QC issues with it, but you might have to like blow some dust off the sensor when you first get it or focus the lens. But the Cadex Rattel for 35 bucks is a very, very good value. Well, how do people care about micros? Asks Three Chic FPV. Like, what can you do with them? Just fly around? I mean, isn't that what we all do with all quads? What do you do with a quad? Just fly around? Yeah, you do the same thing with micros that you do with bigger quads. You just do it in a smaller space. I think a lot of people who are in countries where there's a hard 250 gram limit really like micros. And a lot of people who live areas where you just don't have like where would you fly if you lived in a big city? You can't just go to a park and fly because there's people there all the time. The ability to take out a small ducted micro and fly it around a place where if you screw up and smash into somebody, you're not going to end up with the police and a hospital bill. That's a big freaking deal. The ability to fly around a small apartment or a small townhome, that's a big freaking deal. Yeah, micros are their own thing. Steam Steamend, the Emacs Eco Motor says it's rated for 4 to 6S. Can I use a 3S? You can. You can, but the KV may not be ideal for 3S. Gen C asks, Fusion or Rapid Fire? What's your guess? When can we expect to test? Gen C, I have a pre-order in with Heli Nation for a, a, a Fusion, and when I get it, then I'll test it, but not before. Until I invent a time machine, I can only test products that have actually been released <laughs> or sent to me by the manufacturer. So that's when you'll get the test. Let's see here. Can you put DJ pop in the discord asks, can you put a patch antenna on DJI goggles? You can DJ pop, uh, Vaz video, video aerial systems. Let me see if I can find a page here. Well, I can't find an actual page for it. Uh, Video Aerial Systems, that's uh, Ivy Crazy's uh, company, has a custom antenna that they've showed specifically for the DJI goggles. Basically, one big patch antenna that goes on the front of the goggles. Um, some people have tested the DJI goggles with the TrueRC X-Air. You can put patch antennas on them. You just got to get the right connector, and it does improve range. <laughs> Mark Bismar in the Discord says, uh, in his opinion, uh, uh, the DJI system works significantly better with Luminaire Axie antennas than with, uh, with their stock antennas. To be fair, TrueRC developed the Axie for GetFPV, so they would kind of be you know, a little motivated to say it works better, but they did some testing. Chamber says, uh, we all know TBS is sending Joshua a fusion to review for free. No, TBS does not. I don't think TBS will be sending me any more gear anytime soon, but that's okay. Thanks to my patrons and the super chats and, and the people who use my affiliate links, I have enough to go ahead and buy that gear for myself to test. What KV would I run on a 5S 5-inch? Um, Steve, 3PO FPV, I think for 5S 5-inch, I feel like around 2150 KV is just about perfect. The beauty of that situation is, I mean, you could go a little lower um, and you could go a little higher. Like you could run 2300 KV on 5S 5-inch and it would just be a t a just really fast and kill your batteries pretty quick, but you could do it. Um, but I think around 2150 KV or maybe a little lower, like 1900 KV, if you want a little more flight time and a little less punch is just about perfect. Is there a camera VTX combo that works best with rapid fire? Asks Ethan Mitchell. Ethan, um, there are a few cameras that seem to not work well with rapid fire, but in general, most cameras work fine. So just pick the camera you think is going to work best. 
Yaman points out, I configured the data port in TBS Agent X to use Smart Audio on his Unify. Still not working. Yaman, uh, what, what I was told er, a little bit later in the stream is you have to be on the latest beta firmware to get Smart Audio working. Steam, steam it. My motors are 2400 kV. Would 3S cause any problems? 3S, 2400 kV, you could do that. It would be a little underpowered, but it would be okay. <laughs> Am I caught up on the super chats? No. I want to get Fly asks, what is PIO? And how should I solder bridge the VTX pads on a Synergy FC with Unify Pro Nano 5G 8? Let's look at the Synergy FC. I think what I would do with a Unify Pro, you need 5 volts for a Unify Pro. Unify Pro Nano, I'm pretty sure, takes 5 volts. They they say HV for all their, their, their VBAT capable ones. Unify Pro Nano 5G8, that is going to be, I'm sure it's 5 volt input, but yeah. Input voltage 5 volts, so then let's look up the Synergy FC and see if we have a solder bridge for 5. No, not the Synergy Football Club. <laughs> let's try this again. Synergy Flight Controller. Where's my solder bridges here? So here's the camera solder bridge for 5 volts ground. No, that's 5 volts output for the camera. Where's the solder bridge? Is it on the other side? Maybe it's on the other side. Let's look at the other side. Receiver, invert, and power. VTX. PIO. Ooh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look this up in the manual. We've got a manual here? Where's the manual? Oh, here we go. I see. So here's the answer to your question about PIO. Let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. No, what? Oh, come on. What are we? Oh, my God. We've gone into mobile mode. Hang on. I zoomed in too far. And now I've lost my picture. Where's the? Oh, my God. Okay, zoom out then. Fine. Are we happy now? Okay. <laughs> PIO stands for pin IO. Pin IO is used to switch the um, the VTX power on and off, and this lets you choose how you're going to do that. So if you bridge this for off, it disables the pin IO function. If you bridge this for PIO, it lets you switch it on and off using the pin IO function and, the, and an aux mode. Similar to real pit. If you have re if you're familiar with the real pit, that's what this basically has a built-in real pit, and then setting it to none means that the power is always on for the VTX. But that doesn't change what voltage the VTX is going to get. How do you set the voltage that the VTX is going to get? I may, it may not be possible to set that. It may just be what voltage does the VTX get? Where is the VTX here? Here we go. Five volts. Yeah. That's for the, yeah. So the looks like the Synergy board is made to provide 5 volts to the Unify and only 5 volts. It's not made to work with a high volt. So that's the answer. And by the way, I want to acknowledge that was a little bit slow to work through that. And I'm like, you might be thinking, why is this guy boring us on a live stream? By, but I, sometimes I just like to let you guys walk through the process with me. I'm like I didn't know the answer. And I wanted to just let you guys follow along as we just kind of figure out the answer by looking at the pinout. So, so there you go. Five zero seven RC says, "What's the most recent product someone wanted you to review and you decline? Any unusual ones lately?" Um, uh, one of the things that's hardest for me to review is frames. A lot of people want me to review their frames, and I got to say, there aren't very many frames that excite me. Um, not that there aren't a lot of good frames out there. It's just that a lot of frames are, are, are kind of just a rehash of the same idea with maybe like a few tweaks. And I'm just like, I don't know what I'm going to say in this review. Oh, it's a frame. Big deal. Um, so I try to focus on frames that have really like novel or interesting
characteristics. Like, for example, hey, oh, don't fall apart on me. It fell apart on me. I haven't put this together. This is the Flynoceros Skull, and it is the TAC FPV sponsored frame. And I will be doing a review of this someday. They sent it to me a few weeks ago, and eventually I'll get to it. But I think this is really cool. So the top plate, here's a little mini review, but the top plate like just is a complete canopy with vertical side plates. And then the bottom, and this is so this is what so impressed me about this. There are these 3D printed TPU like bushings almost, and a standoff goes in, and it basically you can see that that can't can't pull through when the standoff is inserted. And then this guy just goes down on here with, and that's a, such a clever way of attaching the tops to the base. It's very, very clever. If you need to change the base out, you can just take these out and you can change it. It doesn't have removable arms. There is a version of this with removable arms. I think this is a pretty clever freaking design. Like one of the challenges that frame designers run into, if you look at Drib's frame, Drib wanted the vertical camera plates so you could mount the camera like this. That's a very, very effective way of mounting the camera. It protects the camera very well. Um, but a lot of times if you use a standard horizontal plate design, then you have to transition to the vertical plates for the camera. And that provides a weak spot. It's very difficult to have that be strong and reinforced. The skull approach is to just use vertical plates everywhere. But then you have the challenge of how to attach it to the arms, right? And this is a very, very clever way of getting around that situation. I'm pretty impressed with it. Um, but a lot of times people ask me to review a frame and I'm like, I don't know what I would do with that. So. Hello, LED Chicken FPV. You caught a live stream live. Welcome. Quad Farm says, Apex is expensive. I'm liking it. Or the new Stingy Frame. The new Stingy Frame is, I'm impressed with the new Stingy Frame. I'm doing a build series on the new Forged Carbon Stingy Frame right now on my channel. Um, there's like two more episodes left to release of that. And then I went to Atlanta and I flew with Stingy. And he challenged me to do some tricks. And I that's going to be the final video in that series. We crashed the crap out of that frame. And it held up really well. I'm pretty impressed with it. Let's see here. Yeah, True Style is talking about the Apex. The PDB on the Apex is designed for using an external OSD, as KISS doesn't have an OSD, and that's what steel flies. And that, to me, has always been the stopping point for me. And when people say, why don't you do more KISS content? Uh, you know, it's that I, ever since Betaflight put the OSD on the flight controller, uh, you guys who are grew up in this era, have no idea what you're missing. <laughs> uh, having a separate OSD that you had to wire to the flight controller with a with a, with a a UART, and then you have to have a whole separate app to configure the OSD and a whole you know, FTDI adapter to flash it, and just such a pain in the ass. It really is. And, like, I did it. I did it. It's not the end of the world. Obviously, you can do it. But every time I think about, oh, should I do some KISS content? And then I'm like, oh, I don't want to go back to those days anymore. And then I just don't. <laughs> the external OSD is such a pain in the ass. It really is. However, as Julian S. points out in the chat, the new OSD is a graphical OSD, and that is pretty freaking cool. In case you don't know what that means, Betaflight is a character-based OSD. You have these letters. Now, some of the letters like look like graphics. Like that's how they make the Betaflight logo is they have custom letters that are just parts of the Betaflight logo. But you can't do things like draw an actual artificial horizon. You have to use the characters. So the ability to have a graphical OSD, right now the only Betaflight flight controller with a graphical OSD is the Brain FPV. The ability to have a graphical OSD on any flight controller, that is kind of exciting. At least then the fact that you have an external OSD is getting you something, right? It's not just a hassle. So that's nice. Siati is here in the chat. Why are you not? Siati, you should be tagged as a moderator, dude. There you go. Siati FPV is tagged as a moderator for my channel now. Um, Siati, I said earlier I would tell you guys 
Siati FPV, in case you don't know, he did two live streams with me last weekend and then the weekend after before that. He has a wealth of knowledge about micros. If you have questions about micros, when I have questions about micros, he's one of the like two or three guys that I just go ask, and he's always super, super helpful. Um, he enjoyed the live streams we did so freaking much. After we finished the live stream last Sunday, he went to his channel and streamed for another two hours. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to start doing this. So he says on Monday nights, after my stream, I stream from 8 to 10 on Mondays. He is going to stream from 10 to 12 on Mondays. So, Siadi, no, he says maybe he'll, oh, I see. He says maybe he'll follow this stream. So, sounds like that's probably what he's going to do. But, um, looks like Siadi will be streaming. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, Siadi, it's true. You know a thing or two about 5-inch also. Yes. You just, I, I also know a thing or two about 5-inch, so I don't really ask you those questions. <laughs> Um, maybe he'll stream at three today after I finish my stream in an hour. We'll let, we'll see if he decides to do that. Probably he will. I'm guessing he will. All right, let's see here. The Apex OSD is pretty nice. Yeah, the Apex OSD does have a USB cable. The fact that it's uh, graphical is nice. Um, Bismar points out for the skull frame, if the stack was mounted to the top, similar to the remix, then that could be cool for noise because, oh, sorry about that. You would kind of get a little bit of vibration isolation from the TPU. That's pretty cool. Hey, Flynosaurus, maybe you could make a version like the remix where the stack mounts to the top plate. And then you have kind of a clean, dirty setup with the TPU. Very interesting. Good point, Mark. Can you get the smoothness of KISS in Betaflight? Asks Tom in the Discord. I don't know the answer to that. Nothing flies as good as KISS, says DE4FPV. That certainly is what the KISS people say. <laughs> Honestly, guys, most of the people who are tagged as mods are just tagged so their name shows up in blue, so I notice them. Technically, they can mod the chat, but... I Let's see here. Go into the super chat. Go into the super chat. What have we got here? Um, Gap Tooth Granny. Thank you for two Canadian dollars. What are the good FPV batteries? 1S, 2S, and 4S. Um, GNB. GNB makes pretty good batteries at a, in a lot of different ranges. Uh, GNB make particularly good micro batteries. Um, I like the race day quad line as a good value for 4S. Uh, some people have said that the race day quad batteries actually are GMB batteries. So maybe it is, maybe that's consistent. MC creations. Thank you for five Brazilian. Hey eyes. Looks like the fusion is going to go to the moon and back and use MIMO. Yeah. I don't know about that. Ruin LS, thank you for 50 Norwegian kroner. What are your thoughts about the Sky 03 OLEDs? Um, I talked a little bit about that earlier in the stream, Ruin. Uh, I'm very excited to see Skyzone giving a, a challenge to the HDOs. I think I, I've I've looked briefly into the OLEDs of the Sky 03 O. I haven't uh, I haven't got them in the mail yet, but I, I borrowed somebody else's and looked at them. I think it looks pretty good. I like the fact that it has adjustable brightness and saturation and stuff, which the HDO doesn't have adjustable saturation or color balance. Um, uh, and I will say also, I didn't say this earlier, but the faceplate on the Sky 030 fit my face perfectly. So that was an issue with the older Sky 02S, I think. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. But the Sky 030, I think it comes with two different faceplates, actually, which brilliant. Thank you, Skyzone. Good for you. Um, but the, the faceplate that came on it fit my face really well. Bachelon, thank you for five bucks. No lights come on my VTX when I plug the battery in. LEDs on the receiver and the flight controller come on. What should I test? I've never used a multimeter before. Bachelon, you need to be measuring DC voltage. So put the multimeter into DC volts. If it needs to have a range selected, select the 20 volt range. And then you're going to put the black multimeter lead on any source of ground. So I often like to touch the US, the outside, not the inside, the outside of the USB port because that's a, that's a nice, easy, convenient place to get ground. 
Then you're going to touch on the red wire going to the VTX and measure the voltage. Sounds like you may have a voltage regulator gone. The LEDs, the receiver, and the flight controller are all running off the 5-volt regulator. Maybe the VTX is off like a 9-volt or a 10-volt regulator that has fried or something. That's what you need to do. Kirtsuki777, thank you for 5 euros. OSD from my True DX swipe on the right, disappear and come back just when I fly. Is it coming from my quad? My reception isn't great, but not bad. Probably, Kirtsuki, what's happening is that you have video noise that is causing the sync pulses to get corrupted, and that makes the OSD move around. If you can clean up the video, like by adding a capacitor to your quad or by changing the power, like if the video transmitter is powered from uh, VBAT, Maybe power the video transmitter from a regulator. That could help clean up that video noise, but that's what you need to do. Let's see here. What are you talking about, Kyle K? Siati says, race day quads being white-labeled GNBs is confirmed 100%. Okay. If you say so. Kyle K says, I think you should do a KISS build, but not do any research on it. Just put it together on a Sunday live stream, then stream that the, the, the FPV. Well, the problem with that, Kyle, is then when I have a problem and I get something wrong, I'm like, oh, KISS sucks. And then other people are like, no, you're just an idiot. And that's not good for me or KISS. <laughs> FPV Freaky wants to know if the OLED screens from the Sky O3 O would fit in the O2Xs. I mean, maybe. Maybe. How are you going to get those screens without buying? At that point, you just bought the O3Os though, right? Riza West asks, what if my quad feels sluggish? It drifts in the corners, and after a roller flip, it tends to overshoot the rotation. Um, you could try raising P gain, Riza West. Based on what you're describing, that's what I think I would do. Raise P gain. <clears throat> Ethan Mitchell wants to know, have you noticed an image quality difference between VTXs? I've noticed the OSD letters are fuzzy when using the TBS Unify, sharp with the Wolf Whoop. Same camera, flight controller, and rapid fire. That's interesting. I haven't noticed that, Ethan. I mean, it is possible that the VTX would cause, like, fuzziness or, or sharpness. Um, that's possible. Is this a good setup, asks Derek Wolf. X9 Lite, Mobula 7, SkyZone, Sky02X. Uh, the only concern I have there, Derek, is that the X9 Lite will not bind to the Mobula 7 out of the box. You will need to update the firmware to allow it to bind to a D16 receiver. That's not the end of the world. Albert Kim, I actually have a video recorded showing how to do it. I just haven't edited it yet. <laughs> Albert Kim has a video showing how to do it, though. Um, that's a good beginner setup, though. I do agree. DC wants to know, TrueRC MX Air or X Air? I've never used the MX Air. Let's look at that one. What is the TrueRC MX Air antenna? Oh, I have heard of this. So this antenna has a like a, a, a weird like mushroom shaped coverage pattern. True 180 degree coverage. This is a weird one. Like you might want this antenna to be like facing straight up. Um I'm not sure I feel like I understand the application of this antenna. And some of the claims it makes are kind of weird. Like pointed at the sky, it can replace an omni. So it's like going to give you omni range above you, but like with higher gain? I don't know. I think I just feel kind of confused about this antenna and I would I, I'm not I don't think I would use this antenna instead of an X air because let's look at an X air. Let's look at a TRC X air. Where's an X air? Linear directional antennas. What? Come on. 5 gigahertz, please. Here's an X air. Look at the coverage pattern of an X air. Right? 
this is a directional. It's like a 10 dB directional antenna. It's got like a 30 degree beam width. This is a completely different application than the MX, which has like a 180 degree pattern. So if you were going to use the MX, you would use it to replace your Omni and you would have it facing straight up. And then you would have the X air facing straight out. And that could be an interesting application. But I'm not sure I really understand or, or trust the things that MX is saying enough to just replace an Omni with it. So there you go. Quadifile says it looks like a radiation pattern from an ordinary vertical antenna. Well, I think Quadifile, what the MX air is doing is normally an Omni pattern is 50% above and 50% below, whereas the MX air is shifting that upwards, which sort of makes sense because if you're flying a quad or an airplane, the, the Omni pattern that's going below you is kind of wasted. So, I mean, I could see the point of the MX Air, but I'm not, I, I'm, I think the X Air should give greater range because it's actually a directional. FPV Arborist just put a GoPro 7 on the quad. Now I get mid-throttle vibes when cruising. Where should I start with tuning it out? Motor PWM frequency. If you're assuming that you're using BL Heli 32 ESCs, I would start by changing the motor PWM frequency in BL Heli Suite. Change it between like 16 kilohertz and 48 kilohertz and just try, you know, move it by like 4 kilohertz and see if you get any differences. That's where I would start. Indonesia, Australia says my quad shakes when armed and just flipped when trying to take off. OSD shows runaway. What could be the problem? Um, here is the answer. There are like four things you need to check to fix that problem. Indonesia, Australia. Here is a video I made about that. There are four things that can cause that and they are described in that video. With the four things are motor direction incorrect, motor mapping incorrect, flight controller alignment incorrect, or prop on wrong. Those are the four things that it can be for those of you who are listening in the podcast. By the way, in case you're wondering, podcast, what podcast? No, I don't have a separate podcast. But what I do, so my patrons were like, we like to listen to your live streams in our podcast reader. Okay. Like, so you don't have YouTube running in the background while you're listening, I don't know, in your car while you're jogging. So um, I found out that Patreon actually has the ability to create a podcast feed for each of the patrons. So I download my live streams, I, I encode them to MP3, and I upload them to Patreon. And then patrons can actually like view the – view, no, listen to the podcast in their podcast reader app. That's one – that's another benefit of becoming a patron if you're interested in doing that. There is a link down in the video description below. Two bucks a month or more if you like. I always say – Join my Patreon at the value you feel you get out of my content, however much you think it's worth to you, for less than a cup of coffee a month. No. <laughs> Let's see here. Can I do turtle mode on Kiss V1 with Betaflight? I don't see why not, Mr. Syncopad. I mean, Kiss V1 supports D-Shot, right? That's all you need. So I, I don't see why not. Chilogy says Attitude V5 or Sky O2X. That is a tough one, Chilogy. Um, the, that is a tough one. Because the Sky O2X, I think it beats the Attitude V5 on specs. But I, I commonly, like when people are over at my house or I'm at a race, I'll have my bag of FPV goggles with me and I'll let people try them on. And more than one person has looked at the Attitude V5 and gone, oh, my God, this looks so good. Something about that OLED screen just knocks certain people's socks off. And I'm like, you sure you wouldn't like the Sky O2? And they're like, no, sold. So uh, that's a tough one because some people are not that impressed with the OLED screen. And in that case, the Sky O2, I think, beats the Attitude on specs. But that OLED, you just can't know without looking at it whether that OLED screen is going to knock your socks off or not.
Lucas Eicher. I've got no current sensor, but I connect it all right. And Betaflight all is set up correctly. I'm using a Kakuta F7 and a Dollar C engine, 40 amp. So what we got to do is we got to look at the pin out of the Kakuta F7, first of all, because we got to see what inputs the Kakuta F7 has. Let's look at the manual for the Kakuta F7. I actually wrote this manual, a little, little fun piece of trivia. So shouldn't I just know the answer? Shut up. Hmm. Let's look at the Kakuta F7 pinout and see what there is in the 4-in-1 plug. Any minute now. Okay. So the 4-in-1 plug goes M4 to 1I. Okay, so... Here's the 4-in-1 plug. I is the electrical symbol for current. So I in this context means that is analog current sense input. And we've got R7, the UART, that would be used for ESC telemetry. So there's two ways of getting current data from an ESC into a flight controller. One is analog and one is ESC telemetry. This flight controller supports both of them. So now we're going to look at your ESC. The dollar C engine, 40 amp. That's probably this one. Now let's look at the pinout of the ESC and see what it does. Come on, baby. No, I don't. Stop. Can't even see the X. What the F? Come on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Stupid pop-ups. Where's the pinout? Dal, where's the pinout, Dal? Oh, thank you. Okay. So the Dal RC engine looks like it has current output, but not telemetry. So we're going to take the current wire from the Dal RC engine, and we're going to connect it to the I wire on the Kakuta F7. And then we're going to, in Betaflight, we're going to set the current source to internal ADC in the power and battery tab. That should do it. How can I be binded, asks Matthew Badao. How can I be binded, but I get no movement on the controller tab in Betaflight? GD it. <laughs> yeah, um, that what you got to do is you got to configure the flight controller to receive the information from the receiver. So the exact way to do that, Matthew, depends on what receiver you've got. You're going to need to set the UART correctly in the ports tab, and you're going to need to set the receiver protocol in the configuration tab. Matthew, if you will uh, put your receiver and flight controller in a super chat so I don't miss it, and I'll see if I can give you more information about exactly what the setup needs to be. Martin Tiger wants to know, what's a reason to get an F7 flight controller over an F4? Um, F7 runs faster. On Betaflight 4.0, that doesn't really matter. There's, there, there's no real benefit. Uh, on Betaflight 4.1, which is going to do RPM filtering, that feature is so processor intensive that the F7 does give the, a little bit of an advantage. The other advantage of an F7 is that the UARTs all support inversion. And the short version of what that means is that you can easily set up things like FreeSky Smart Port, FreeSky S Bus. That's about it without having to deal with any nonsense with the UARTs. So F7s will usually have more UARTs and easier to configure UARTs. Any follow-up on my Flight 1 Falco X build, Gel Capitain? I mean, I've flown it since then, but, you know, no, no. There, it'll be in my vlog from Orlando, but no, real, you know, it flies really nice. Let's see here. Hmm, let's get some super chats out of the way. I see a couple of them coming in. Raymond Andre Langas, thank you for 100 Norwegian kroner. What do you think about making an X8 6-inch FPV quad? I mean, that sounds, I mean, you, you want me to make it? I don't know about that. That sounds pretty cool. Are you going to make it? I'm excited for you. <laughs> Rise FPV, thanks for two bucks. Can't find VBAT on your JBF4. Rise FPV, do you mean you can't? find a VBAT output, you could just use the ESC plus pad. That's easy. Peter Rossbun, thank you for $50, Peter. Biggest donation of the stream. Thank you so much, dude. Uh, just good job. Keep it up. KG5MTF73. 
uh, cam4otn. I don't know the year, though. Thank you, Peter. That's a, it's a huge donation. Thank you so much for your generosity. Back, You know, it means a lot, too. I always, I mean this. I always say contribute at the level that you feel you get value back. I don't ever want somebody to be like, I guess I'll contribute. Fine. Never. Never. I want you to be like, geez, fine. I'm, you've helped me so much. I, yes, please take my money. That's how I want you to feel about supporting me. If you feel the least bit reluctant, the least bit hesitant, if you don't feel like I earned it, don't give me a single penny. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Uh, so when I see donations like Peter giving 50 freaking dollars, like that, like I'm, of course I'm glad to have $50. We all would like to get $50, wouldn't we? But it also feels really good to know that somebody out, somewhere out there, there's somebody who went, wow, yes, no problem. Just take 50 bucks. You've helped me so much. That means a lot to me. Thank you, Peter. Back RDFPV, thank you for five bucks. Diatone 349, hot motors and won't come down. Lower D gains to nothing. Replaced motors still sounds on hard throttle. You did the right thing, back RDFPV. Um, if you have excess vibration or electrical noise, two symptoms of that are very hot motors and that the quadcopter won't come down when you lower throttle. It may just try to fly to the moon the minute you arm it. Um, so you've done the right thing, lowering D gains. If you lower the D gains all the way to zero and you still have super hot motors, that starts to lean towards like an ESC or motor problem because it's the D term that makes the quad fly away and makes the motors hot. But even with like, did you lower the D gains all the way to zero? Like with D gains literally at zero, you shouldn't get hot motors, but I guess anything is possible. Um, here's the thing though, back RD, it's a ready to fly. If you if it like if you crashed it into a brick wall and then this happened, that's not Diatone's fault. But if it's if you got a Diatone 349 like brand new and it was having this problem, go back to Diatone and please ask them to help you because you shouldn't have that experience with a brand new quad. So let's assume that like it was fine but then you crashed it. The next thing I'd be looking at is the flight control stack. Is the flight controller like loose or flapping around? It's not always obvious when you're on the ground, but when it gets, if you pull on the flight controller, if you can move it at all, it could be vibrating in the air. In fact, just this weekend, I was flying at a at a location with Drew with Drib, and he was like, "Wow, this new flight controller that I'm testing has a real problem with D gain." In fact, he started blaming my ESC. He had my ESC. Thank you, Drew, for flying my ESC. I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, man, I want to support you. I'm like, oh, I really appreciate that. Um, he was he was like, when he was like, your ESC is giving me some problems with noise. I'm like, I don't think that's possible. Well, it turns out that two of his standoffs had come loose, and literally the flight controller was just flapping around, and that causes symptoms like hot motors and so forth. So that's the next thing I would check back, RD. Joshua Rayleigh wants to know, thank you for five bucks, Joshua. Can I use KISS ESCs on an SP Racing F3? I don't see why not. I don't see why not. Um, the thing is, though, you will have trouble updating the firmware because KISS ESCs are made to interface with a KISS flight controller, and I'm not sure that they'll be able to do the telemetry pass-through. Maybe they can, though. Quadifile points out that 73 is ham mumbo jumbo for best regards. Okay, didn't know that. I'm not really a ham. I have a ham license because a ham license is required to use a, a, a video transmitter in the US. Didn't know that, did you? It is. Oh no, but I'm under 25 milliwatts. It's okay. No, it's not. Oh no, but I uh, my video transmitter is locked. Doesn't matter. You're supposed to have a ham license in the US to use any of these devices. There's a bunch of misinformation out there. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to, it's not like anybody's going to come find you for it. But technically, you are supposed to have that. Yep, the house blog. I have a Larva X. It's sitting right here. Oh, there, there it is. Thank you, Happy Model. Here, we'll do this. Hello. Haven't flown it yet. Got a lot of things, got a lot of other things to do. Niek Westernick wants to know TBS Unify Pro or Rush Tank. I'll tell you this, Niek. The Rush Tank VTXs are really freaking good. I would like to revisit them in a video. They've just released a new one, a new mini one, a 20 millimeter form factor. They have really good performance and, and good price too. Here's the new 20 millimeter mini one. This would be great for a build like the Stingy uh, frame that has a 20 millimeter stack on the back. 
uh, very easy to mount, great for a micro build, of course. Um, they have pretty consistent quality, pretty consistent video output, good feature set, good price. These are uh, these are like I think if you're looking for a, like not a bargain basement but like a mid tier, great performance at a mid tier price. I, I I heartily recommend the Rush Tank. Um, everybody I know who uses them is really impressed with them, and they have pretty consistent quality. I haven't. I'm always I'm always hesitant to recommend a new product because like the first batch could be really good, but then suddenly they have a bunch of crap. But the Rush Tanks have been around for a little while and they've been pretty solid. So. I like him. Matt Flowrida, true style in the Discord, says, I have two Rush tanks. Currently, I like them. 20 by 20 on my 3-inch. The Rush tank 20 by 20, the top plastic cover is meant for M2 hardware, but you can use the VTX without it with M3 hardware. Good to know. DJ Pop wants to know, how the F can Drew make such smooth footage when he has all of his quads beaten to death? I don't know. I want to know. Like, I had a conversation. I don't think this is going to make the vlog, but I had a conversation with Drew uh, in when I was in Florida about the difference between Drew and Mr. Steel. And Drew was saying, Steel and I have a lot of similar interests. Steel's into cars. Drew's into cars. You, you didn't know this. Drew, before he was into quads, he was a sponsored car modder. Like, he would, you know, install a turbo kit, install an exhaust kit. Companies that made like an exhaust kit would send him the exhaust kit and he would make a review video about it. This was like way back when there's a video out there that you can some you may still be able to find it uh, of of like, you know, baby Drew doing a, a review of this. So he's like steals into cars. Drew's into cars. Steals into skateboarding. Drew's into skateboarding. They're both into quads. But he, Drew was talking about the difference between steel and Drew is steel wants all his gear to be like perfect he wants his motors to be perfect his quad to be exactly right and then he makes amazing stuff whereas drew and i don't know how it does this all his stuff is constantly just bashed to shit his motors are all gravelly grindy if he starts the day with a clean gear he'll bash the crap out of it and destroy it by the end of the day his stuff will be destroyed but somehow he gets this amazing amazing smooth footage i don't know and i would like to know dj pop i would like to know I'd like to find out that there's a trick so I could use the trick. I really don't know and it really bothers me. Like I'll go to a site and I'll fly and I'll have like one tiny bad prop and like all my footage is ruined. And Drew will be literally just like spitting on his motor, blowing it out, turning it, sand falling out of it, slap a prop on it, go fly and just get amazing footage. I don't know. Anyway, hashtag beta flight. Yeah, it's beta flight. He doesn't even fly kiss. Like if he flew kiss or flight one, then people would go, aha, it's because kiss is so good. And flight one is so good, but he flies beta flight. It's just true. You know, the stories like, you know, the stories, you know, the, the blues player is so good on the guitar that people think, oh, he must have went down to the crossroads and made a deal with the devil, sold his soul. Well, that's Drew. I mean, that's what it, it's like, I don't know how he does it. Okay, enough talking shit about Drew. Does he use real steady? Not that I know of Rick Bent. Rick, I have, I have seen Drew edit flight videos. Like, not like I'm spying on him, just like I'm at his house or we're at an Airbnb and he's just doing his edit. I have never seen Drew use real steady. He just takes the footage, drops the footage on his timeline and edits it. And it just looks amazing. I mean, I'm sure he's throwing out crap footage. But the fact that he gets any good footage at all, given how beat to crap his quads are, is is a testament to something. Anyway. Let's see here. How much time does Drew spend tuning, asks True Style. I don't know the answer to that. I'll ask him. Let me ask him. Let's see if he gets back to me. Okay. Okay, we'll see if he answers me. He may be busy. 
Yeah, Mark points out, Real Steady has a super distinct look that you can't miss if you know what you're looking for. Uh, that being said, Mark, I do think you can dial Real Steady down to the point where maybe you would miss it, but then it would also be less effective. What would be the best upgrade after a frame switch, but now my quad feels way too heavy, asks Wes Lowe's. Um, Wes, you're going down a road that you may not like where you end up because here's what happened, Wes. You had a nice lightweight quad that flew really good. Then you switched frames and now your quad is heavier. And you're like, oh, I don't like this. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to upgrade the motors to bigger motors. But the problem is that's going to make your quad heavier too. You're never going to get back that ultralight feeling. Now, that's not a problem. A heavier quad can fly good. It's going to fly different though. And you may not like that. If you are used to the way that a really light quad flies, you're not going to get that back except by keeping your quad lightweight. So... If you find that the quad feels really heavy, the direction I would go is make sure you have good, powerful motors and high pitch props. The high pitch props are going to make enough thrust that'll kind of bring back some of that feeling of sharpness, but it's not going to bring that back the feeling of lightness. Alex Dalton says, if you're flying with someone with a ham license, you don't need one. We should let's we should all have a ham license, technically, though, Alex. I mean, come on. Bachelon says, I'm getting five volts into my VTX, the same one from your build series, but no LEDs come on. I am pretty sure, Bachelon, that the VTX the VTX that I use in, I don't know which build series you're talking about. Doesn't it require VBAT though? I think, or double check this because if you feed VBAT into a 5 volt VTX, you will fry it. So don't fry your VTX. But I think the VTX that I use in my build series needs VBAT. And that would explain why it's not powering on if you're feeding it 5 volts. All right, looks like Ciotti is con committing to a 3 p.m. stream. In a half hour, when my stream goes off the air, y'all go raid Ciotti FPV's stream. Um, he's a moderator now, so he can post the link in the chat. Don't post the link yet, Ciotti. Everybody will leave. Don't, don't make people leave my stream. But uh, <laughs> how do you remove chopped up plants and grass from your quad? Asks Leonidas GFX. Leonidas? Leonidas. Anyway. Um, uh, I don't. Here's what I do. Uh, I lick my thumb and I take my camera lens and I go, e -e -e -e, and then I take my shirt and I go, Ch -ch 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 -ch, and then I fly. I don't clean my quads at all. Okay, I don't care. I don't, I don't, I fly the quad to make awesome footage and do awesome tricks. I don't give a damn how the quad looks. Some people are commenting on my Stingy V2 build. They're like, these are great parts, but boy, what a schlock with your electrical tape. It looks like crap. I'm like, I don't care. You can't see it when I'm flying it. What do you care? I ain't making it for product pages. I'm not trying to do a, a, a showcase of my build skills. I, I want you to see me fly it. I build for performance and durability, not for looks. So I don't care if there's grass on it. Drone and Man wants to know, can you substitute a left-hand polarized antenna with an Omni or right-hand antenna? The short answer... Short answer to that is yes. The longer answer is yes. Okay, that's a that's a that's a classic joke. Who's who who's that joke from? I don't remember who originally made that joke. Here's the longer answer um, about polarization. If you, the the longer answer is that you need polarization on the quad and the goggles to match. If you have a left hand antenna on the goggle, you need to have a left hand antenna on the quad. Vice versa for right hand. Neither is better but they have to match. The other thing is that if you have a linear on the quad, you can use either left or right. It doesn't matter. You will, you will get the best reception with a linear, but if you happen to have a circular, it's still pretty good. Eventus Gaming says, if my SMA antenna free spins, is that bad? Um, you've got to figure out what you're asking here. If the SMA connector is not tight enough, 
then the pin will not fully engage and the antenna will rotate. Okay, the SMA connector will rotate. That just means you need to tighten down. If it is fully tight and the actual coaxial cable is rotating because it's ripped or torn, then the antenna needs to just be thrown away. Eh, you could probably solder it, but I would just throw it away. Is it true? True Style in the Discord wants to know, is it true that it's okay to clean electronics with uh, distilled water? I always use rubbing alcohol. Um, the issue with water is this, uh, True Style. If the electronics are powered up and you put water on it, then you can get a short circuit and damage something. So obviously it needs to be powered down. The other issue is that you can get mineral deposits and corrosion. Um, what you can do is you can – so distilled water means you won't get any mineral deposits. Don't count on like your city water or if you're like me, God forbid, and you're on well water, you're going to get tons of minerals. Um, so use distilled water and then you don't want the water to sit on the board because you can get corrosion from the water. So you can definitely rinse electronics out with distilled water. It is totally safe. Some people will then follow it up with alcohol because the alcohol will help evaporate any remaining water, or you could just put it in front of a fan or something. Don't put it in a bag of rice. But yeah, you definitely can use distilled water to clean your electronics. That is no problem. You just want to make sure that no water is left on it when you're done cleaning it. So. Okay. Everyday FPV wants to know, I'm an R9M user. Is there an advantage to using a TBS Diamond versus the Super 8? The TBS Diamond and the Super 8 just have different coverage patterns. The Diamond is designed to be a little flatter and further out, whereas I don't actually – I know the default antenna is a little taller. The Diamond also tries to deal with some nulls in the coverage pattern of the normal antenna. What's the Super 8? Is that a Crossfire antenna? No. Um, the Super 8. Oh, that's the dipole. Oh, I don't know the coverage of, pattern of the Super 8 off the top of my head to compare it to the diamond, but that's what you would want to do. So I'm trying to look this up for you guys right here on the stream. It looks like the Super 8 has a fairly circular uh, pattern just from looking at this coverage diagram. So I'm kind of like, what's the what's the advantage of the Super 8? Whereas if we compare it to the Diamond, we're going to see the – it's a little flatter, I think. Here we go. There's a gnat flying around. So the TBS Diamond is a little less circular. It has a little bit more of a null above itself, um, but it's going to get you a little further out. So with antennas, there's no one best antenna. It's just you need the right antenna for the application. Oh, haha. <laughs> Gel Captain says Super 8 is just a clone of the diamond. Oh. Okay. Well, I would take the antenna designed by Alex Grieve over the antenna designed not by Alex Grieve. So there you go. <laughs> Does hot glue... Uh, decrease radio signals. I want to put a hot a glob of hot glue on the VTX antenna to increase durability. Mr. Tux, hot glue can change the tuning of the antenna slightly, um, but you probably won't notice a difference. Can you run Cameron Scarlett wants to know? Can you run a Kiss Flight controller on Betaflight? You can. Betaflight will run on a Kiss Flight controller. That. Uh, you may struggle to get some of the functions working because, like, the KISS flight controller is designed for the KISS functionality, but it will work. MO says, my flight controller suddenly doesn't show signs of life. I didn't even crash it. It's, like, two weeks old. It's an F405 Mark II. MO, if it doesn't even power up from USB, it's just dead. I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, if you didn't even crash it, you can try going back to the vendor and see if they'll replace it. Should be polite. Tell the truth. Tell them what happened. And ask, is there anything you can do for me? Like, that's the, like, don't be a jerk about it. Don't be like, I'll, I dare you. I sold me this piece of crap. I didn't even crash it. Now it's broken. I demand that you give me my money back. Don't do that. Don't do that. Nobody's going to respond well to that. But just tell them the truth. And a lot of times they'll help you out. Uh, 
Let's see here. Can you use thermal tape on motors and ESCs? I don't know why you would use thermal tape on motors. Motors don't need thermal tape. You can use thermal tape on ESCs, yeah? Thank you, Vasco Baloo, for three euros seventy-eight. I don't. That's an oddly specific amount. I assume there's some reason for that. Three euros seventy-eight. Can you use an e-bike battery for field charging? Totally. The number one thing you need to be aware of is the voltage that the battery outputs. If it's like a forty-eight volt battery or something, some of these. There's a gnat in here. It's driving me crazy. Sorry. I'm gonna get it. Some of these e-bike batteries and skateboard batteries are like. Uh, 48 volts, high voltage. You're going to want to make sure that the voltage is safe for your charger. But if the voltage is within the range that your charger supports, like whatever it is, 30 volts, if it's under that, then you're fine. Yeah, you totally can do it. Double A in the Discord wants to know, are there video channels that are better for a certain polarization? No. Nope, not really. Um, it's not like channel race one is better for left hand and race two is better for right hand. It doesn't matter at all. Some antennas are tuned better on certain channels than others, but there's no preference between frequency and polarization. Yeah, Kyle K definitely, like Kyle K points out, a 48 volt pack can, if it's fully charged, remember that's the nominal voltage, the fully charged voltage can be much higher. So I would definitely, before I try to do that, measure with a multimeter the voltage that it's putting out and make sure, I think I got it. Make sure that uh, it's within the safe range. Parker Boy says, uh, "There, are, I want to purchase some new motors, and there are just so many. Parker Boy, I'm so glad you gave me the opportunity to plug my website. My website here, fpvknowitall.com, uh, the home of the ultimate FPV shopping list, where I have all my product recommendations. And let me just be clear, these are not the only parts that I recommend. There are many great products and parts out there that are not on this page. The point of this page is to help you narrow down the selection. If you feel like there's just so many motors out there and you don't know which one to pick, one of these will work for you. It's not that there are, it's not these are the only good motors out there, but if you just don't want to dig through all the options, one of these will be a good choice for you to help you pick it. And yes, all of these links are affiliate links, so you can help support me by clicking these links and making any purchase after you click any one of these links at one of these affiliated vendors. Anyway, there you go. So you want a, you want a motor suggestion? FPV know-it-all. Check it out. There you go. LED Chicken FPV says, I tried to do a super chat, but as I was typing the message, the amount changed to $500. Now I... That's all he said. Waiting for that $500 super chat LED chicken. I don't know about that, my friend. I have no ability to affect your super chats in case that's what you're like think, accusing me of. Um, if you send me a $500 super chat, I don't know what I'll do. Drew has answered me. Uh, Livestream wants to know how much time does Drew spend tuning? He says, not much, couple hours whenever a new version of Betaflight comes out just to figure out the changes. Then I don't really touch it and use a pretty similar tune across all my builds. That's the answer. I'll tell you, I, I, the number one thing I do, like this new Stingy build, I finished building it the literally the morning that I left for Atlanta to go fly with Stingy. Literally, I was doing the, the Hover Maiden. And uh, then I arrived and I was like, okay, it flies. Let's get it flying as good as possible in a short amount of time. And the first thing I do to get a quad flying good is I go into beta flight and I turn off the gyro filters and I turn off the stage two D-term filter. Now, if you do this and you smoke your motors, do not blame me. I do it carefully. I, I do it. I turn off the gyro filter and I fly and I see if the motors are super hot. If you do this and your quadcopter flies to the moon and falls in a lake, do not blame me. I'm a professional. But the very first thing I do with Betaflight to get a quad flying better is I turn off as many of the filters as I can. And if I don't smoke the motors and if it doesn't fly to the moon, it flies amazing. I didn't even touch the pids, to be honest with you. Uh, 
Bismar Mark says, don't do that on Betaflight 4.1. Yes. The other thing is, on, on a new version of Betaflight, I don't just go bonkers and start t turning off filters. I, I listen to smart guys like Mark Spatz, UAV Tech, tell me. I got that trick from Mark Spatz, UAV Tech, who knows a lot about filters and tuning. Scott in the Discord asks, what do I think of the Catalyst Machine Works Smooth Operator? I have a review, Scott, of the Smooth Operator that contains all my thoughts about it. The short version is, it is a crazy, innovative, interesting, durable frame, but it's so stinking fiddly and tight that every time I break something on it, I just want to throw it in the garbage. And I don't want to work on it. So I like it, but I... I, I it's just too much for me. That's that's a comment about me, not a comment about it. It's made for racers. Racers don't care about stupid tight fiddle. See what 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 the problem with the smooth operator is Catalyst Machine Works at its heart is a racing house. They are just are racers in their brain and they were like, oh, "Let's make a freestyle frame." And they made a freestyle frame as if they were for coming from a racing mindset. Racers want stupid tight fiddly. They don't care. They just want the best flying quad at any cost freestyle pilots are freaking lazy and don't don't feel that way so that's what i would say where is uav tech i don't know let's see here can i use a portable cell phone charger for my 1s batteries yeah you could use a power bank just be aware that a cell phone power bank might only put out like 500 milliamps it might charge really slowly any review of a tyro 69 anytime soon i have no specific plans for a tyro 69 my friend sorry about that um oh wow bachelon says yeah i think i fried it I wired the VTX and camera together into a 5-volt hole. Well, that's not its not a problem. Undervolting something won't fry anything. I also realized my ground wire is in the battery plus hole instead of ground. that That's a bad, that's bad. If you put bat plus into ground, bad things will happen. <laughs> Desolder everything, cross your fingers, and see if it all powers up. Tom021 uh, in the Discord asks, is your pin tuning masterclass still viable with Betaflight 4.1? And Mark Bismar says no and yes. I agree, Mark. Um, here's what I would say. I think the pin tuning masterclass is still a great way to like see what what does the P term do? And what does the P term like canonically look like when it's too high? What does the D term do? And 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 the I term. But Betaflight 4.0 and 4.1 have added so much that I don't think you can use the pit tuning masterclass directly to tune. Yeah, Mark says the most valuable thing in my pit tuning masterclass is identifying P and D oscillations by ear. Totally agree. Like a P term oscillation still sounds like a P term oscillation and likewise a D term oscillation. Low I gain still gets all weird and floaty the same. But if what you want is to actually tune the quad, that's not the first place I would go. <sighs> Sorry, guys, got a little bit of a sniffle. The quad on top of the Larva X is the Beta FPV HX toothpick. They've sent it to me to review. Luis Lima wants me to comment on the Newbie Drone Hummingbird flight controller. Lewis, the reason, and you've asked the question so many times, I'm going to answer you, even though I'm not going to answer you. The reason I'm not answering your question is that is the Silverware board, and I haven't flown it. So Silverware is an alternative firmware for, for, designed specifically for tiny whoops. Um, if you want to fly Silverware, this is probably a great way to do it. But I don't actually can't comment on it because I, I haven't ever flown it. So that's why I'm not answering your question. Bogdan Musial wants to know, is FreeSky Access coming to older transmitters? I don't know the answer to that. Um, FreeSky, I thought they said that they were going to do it, but then I haven't heard any more about it. So I wouldn't assume that they that that uh, it's going to come. Um, Adam Zuzig's, I'm sorry, Adam, I can't pronounce Polish names. 
I apologize. <laughs> Adam says, uh, does Betaflight 4.1 have RPM filter ready to go, or do you still have to use CLI commands? I think you still have to use CLI commands, Adam. Uh, Mark uh, Bismar in the Discord forwarded me a Betaflight uh, pull request or merge that was supposed to make it like, ah, it's all ready to go now. No more CLI commands. But I'm not sure that's gone through yet. <laughs> Tomas, thank you for five bucks in the super chat, Tomas. Can I add GPS to my? I have Hype Train, Rotor Riot Control, and a DJI system. Uh, Tomas, you can add GPS to the Riot Control flight controller. You just need a spare UART. But how will you use it? Because the, the GPS... It really interacts with the OSD, the on-screen display, to show you things like the direction home arrow and the GPS coordinates. Since the DJI FPV system doesn't allow you to use the Betaflight OSD, I think your ability to use GPS is going to be pretty limited. <sighs> Tom says, uh, as a beginner with like five packs, I'm noticing some wobbles. Should I start changing P and D and not care about filters? I, I, yeah, Tom, I kind of agree with you. Um, UAV Tech, uh, Mark Spatz, his tuning guide says start by tuning the filters. And he's not wrong, but especially as a beginner, you probably are not going to be noticing the more subtle things that filter changes will bring out. Um, the exact nature, but don't just, I mean, I was going to say don't just start changing P and D willy nilly. If you change P and D in a methodical way and watch the effect on flight, that can be a good way to learn. That's how I learned what P and D do. But don't just like yank them around and don't fly in a methodical way and explore if that's really the direction you want to go. Why does the Mamba F7 Mini not support anything further back than 4.1 on beta flight? Asked Marcos Huerta. Marcos, the whenever a new flight controller comes out, the manufacturer has to create a target file for it, a target definition, and then they submit that target definition to the beta flight devs via a pull request that then has it included. They don't do that retroactively. So the F7 Mini has just come out. They've submitted the pull request. It just hasn't been merged into beta flight yet, and that's why it's not available for previous versions. Someone could build an earlier firmware it could be done just no one has done it and probably no one will <laughs> rb wants to know is there a big enough effect of using a vtx channel from the lower end of five gigahertz over a channel from the upper end with a lower frequency penetrate further uh no rb you you are correct that lower frequency signals often have more range than higher frequency signals and better penetration um, the reasons for that, let's not go into the difference between like a hundred megahertz or something at five gigahertz is just not that much. The bigger effect will be if your, your antenna probably has a sweet spot in its tuning curve. The antenna's tuning curve, the VSWR is probably not completely flat. So most antennas will be optimally sensitive at a certain frequency and slightly less sensitive at other frequencies. Now, unfortunately, there's no way to know what that frequency is without actually putting your antenna on an antenna tester. So, um, but th some frequencies may work better than others based on your antenna, but not based on the, the fact that it's a lower or a higher frequency. <laughs> Chilogy wants to know, does the type of frame really matter when it comes to flight performance? Chilogy, uh, I think that you're probably not likely to notice more subtle differences like whether it's an H frame or a stretched X or a pure X geometry, whether it's got a slightly higher, slightly low center of gravity, top mount or bottom mount battery. Somewhere out there, there's a pilot who might be able to notice that. Uh, but probably most of us aren't that pilot. Um, I think when choosing a frame, weight matters. And not just the weight of the frame, but the implied weight of the whole build. When you get an ultra light, ultra compact racing frame, 
you can only fit so much gear in there. It's going to be a light build, no matter, you just can't make it too heavy. When you get a heavier, sort of super roomy freestyle frame, it kind of invites you to put a bunch of heavy gear on there. Um, so the weight of the frame definitely matters. And then the aerodynamics of the frame will have an effect on flight performance. Um, if you look at something like the Carreria Talon frame with the vertical arms on the Carreria Talon frame. Here, let's put a picture of it up. This frame, the, the vertical arms have kind of a rudder effect, as you can feel in the turns. Um, it's a carving effect in the turns. It also means that it's way more sensitive to wind being blown offline. So there will be some effects of the frame that you can feel. Um, but... For the most part, frames of a similar design are going to fly pretty much the same. The PID controller, your rates, and your stick inputs as a pilot are probably going to be what makes the biggest difference. Quad Farm says, my Alien is lighter than my Reverb, but the Alien feels heavier. Well, the reverb seems to float, even though it's about 15 grams heavier. That may be due to aerodynamics quad farm. The alien has a lot of flat surfaces like the arms, whereas the reverb has less surface area. So it may seem to float more because the air doesn't drag it down as much. Anyway. Okay. Well, we are coming to the end of the stream. Ah, oh, and I'm coming to the end of my drink. That can only mean one thing. <laughs> we're coming to the end of the stream i want to thank you guys so much for coming out and watching before you go don't hey, 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 don't go anywhere you hear me wrapping up the stream and you're like okay i'm out of here don't go aaron siati is going to stream at three o'clock on his channel aaron go ahead and post the link if you've got the live stream ready to go i don't know what your deal is but i'll post a link over to his channel at the very least let me pull that link up real quick. Siati FPV. He's going to be live streaming, uh, doing a Q&A similar to this. And um, he is super knowledgeable about micros. Anything for three inch. He's a real expert on anything three inches and smaller. Am I right, Siati? Just ask my wife. No. Wait, no. Ask his wife. Damn it. All right. Forget it. Uh, no, and he also knows about a lot of stuff. He had big success when he was on my uh, stream and big success on his own stream. So if you guys uh, can't get enough Q&A, head on over there as soon as I wrap up. And uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming out. Thanks to everybody who donated in the Super Chat um, for your support. Thank you for, to all the patrons in the Discord. If you want to become a patron and join my Discord, there's a link down in the video description. Two bucks a month or more, whatever you feel like I've earned. Go ahead and sign up. Um, and thanks to everybody, regardless of what you do, even if you're just here watching, asking questions, you know, uh, thank you so much for everything you do to help make my channel a success and make me a success. I will see you guys next at 8 p.m. tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern time when I do my Monday evening stream. This week on my channel, look forward to, I'm going to finish the Stinger Swarm Forge Carbon build series. There are two more videos in that. Then I'm going to release the video where me and Stingy go. Stingy does a freestyle trick, and then I try to copy it and crash a lot and see if it, we break his frame. So there's some, some nice freestyle tutorial in there. As Stingy tells me, no, dude, here's what you're doing wrong. Uh, some okay flying and a lot of crashing. Uh, that's coming out this week. A few other things I'm going to be working on, but um, that's going to do it for this live stream. Uh, I posted my channel. No, I didn't. No, this is Aaron's channel. What are you talking about? You sure about that? How about that? Is that Aaron's channel? I think it is. Yeah, no, that's Ciotti. Maybe I copy pasted, but wrong by accident. Anyway. There's Ciotti's channel. There's his live stream. So head on over there now. And uh, otherwise, just I'll see you guys later. Going to have a good day. Um, that's going to do it. Happy flying, everybody.